It's been a very special morning, I think, uh, and just uh, communion and contemplating that sacrifice of Jesus for us. And he did it for a reason that we could be reconciled back to God and enjoy the presence of God that they had in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve walked with God, talked with Him, shared, played, everything. And that's God's heart, that we get reconciled back to God. But the problem was sin. And uh, sin to be forgiven and removed has to have blood sacrifice. That's God's law. First it was a lamb, but that didn't remove it, it just covered it. But then Jesus, the Lamb of God, came and died for us. Wow. And he took my sins and my pride and everything that I am. And he paid the price so that I could go free. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This morning, I just want to share a few scriptures, particularly a, a psalm, Psalm 16. Uh, it's just very been very special to me over the years, this particular psalm. And uh, it's been recently the reality of the psalm uh, in my my life, the reality, it's like I know the 23rd Psalm, which is the Lord is my shepherd, but I actually, you know, you can know the Psalm and not know the shepherd. <laughs> and we get that way in a lot of it. We know the scriptures, but we don't know the one who wrote them. And that's what he wants. And the message this morning is a, kind of a different title. The first part of the message is called the joy of your presence and the second part is called the beginning of the end so we'll see what what the lord <laughs> brings here i was thinking about being saved and maybe that's what the why why i all, all that i've been thinking about uh, lately but when you're saved you're rescued from something to something and that's what's important. It's, it's not just rescued, but you're rescued to something else. You're saved from something to something else. And so we are saved from sin and the penalty of sin and the eternal death and hell and destruction. We're saved from that, but what is it to? And the two is we are reconciled back to God to have this joyful, real, in reality, now relationship with God, talking and being with Him. The joy of being with His presence or being with God. We know the Scriptures, Romans 3.23, we've all sinned. We know 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but, and I love the word but in there, it cancels everything else. The gift of God is what? Eternal life. Life eternal. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so from this, we are rescued from, from eternal death to eternal life. We are from death to life, from slavery to freedom, from the kingdom of darkness and rule over our lives to the kingdom of light and his love. Hallelujah. And that's what we have. And what better joy could you have? And this psalm, for Psalm 16, uh, which I, I'll read some of it in a minute, but it's the last verse. And King David wrote this, and it was from very, very deep expressions, uh, experience of his life, and it even says it is engraved into his heart, this particular psalm. And the last verse of his psalm of what he goes through, you can read it at, at home or something, but verse six, chapter 16, verse 11, it says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I mean, we, how many of you know this verse? 
Yeah, I mean, we, I've done it for many years, but like I said, the reality has been coming much more this year, particularly, I believe, in the last times. I read this verse in, in many different versions, but the NLT version really uh, helped me, uh, not helped me, but showed me even closer to get in with God. It says in, in the NLT, you will show me the way of life. I like that the others pass, but we know that Jesus is the way. And Jesus is the life. <laughs> wow. Right? And he's the truth of it all. You will show me this way of life with God, granting me the joy of your presence and the, pl I love this last, the pleasures of living with you forever. Wow. And I was looking at just, there's three things. Number one is the word life. And it comes, the Greek word, when they, in, in the Greek, it, it, it means the fullness of life that comes from a relationship with God. And that's why John 10, 10 is so famous, what the devil does, but then Jesus says, I have come. Come, what do you mean come? Not just come to the house. He came from heaven to, to earth. Why? To give you life. This life with God again. And not just life, but life abundantly. Hallelujah. So he's the way, the life. And then the joy of his presence. And that comes by the Holy Spirit. When you're filled and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You don't have to come to church to be in his presence. He wants you to have that presence and know it. I will never leave you and I am with you always. Even when you're shopping, even when you're at home, and when you're sleeping, He is always there. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The joy of that. And then finally, the pleasures of living with you forever, now, in eternity, the pleasures of this joy. And so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, how can all this be? You know, what, especially in the times we live in. Just looking at uh, this psalm a little more in context, in verse 8, he gives says something, I have set the Lord always before me. That's what David said. Even when he committed adultery, even when he committed murder, even when he had all these things go wrong, and all the stress of life and everything, he was a fugitive and all that, but he says, I have set the Lord, or other version says, I have put my eyes on the Lord. Hallelujah. He's made a commitment. Everything he does is involved with the Lord. And I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Hallelujah. Whatever the situations, I am not going to be shaken and give up because the Lord is with me and I have set my eyes on Therefore, my heart, verse 9, is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells securely. Wow. For you will not abandon my soul to shield or let your Holy One see corruption. Wow. We're going to go on to heaven. We're going to, when we pass away, we're on our way. Man, we got this life. Hallelujah. He's given it to us. And even, that's a prophetic word about Jesus, actually. Didn't leave him in the grave. Didn't, didn't leave him there. And he won't let us either. You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And this is what the Lord said to me just in this portion. He says, the Lord wants you to enjoy the journey. Hallelujah. He really does. He wants us to enjoy this life that he's given us. I mean, it's, it's fantastic, you know, walking with him and, and t talking. And his whole purpose for reconciliation is that we can enjoy his presence and enjoy living with him forever. Because God loves you. Hallelujah. God loves you, and he has a plan for your life. Hallelujah. And if, if you're here maybe for the first time or have never experienced this incredible joy, he wants you to come. 
Of course, there's a problem, as I said before, and the problem is sin. That separates us from God. But Jesus paid the price, and he's ready to call you. Just come. Come to him. God loves you and has a plan. 1 Corinthians is sec- chapter 2, verse 9 is an incredible verse for every one of us. It is written, No eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even imagine how good it can be. Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, I can imagine some pretty good stuff, but it's nothing compared to what he's got planned. He's got a plan for your life, and it's a wonderful, wonderful plan. Now, I want to go to the book of Acts now, and this is what kind of struck me, and I call it the beginning of the end, but the reason I'm going there is because Psalm 16, verse 11 where he showed me the way of life grant, and granted me the joy of your presence and so on like that. Peter preaches his first sermon and he quotes that verse. And I thought, what? I thought it was all about repentance and this and that and that. And it was. But he wanted to show what the real life, eternal life is about. And it was fantastic. So, so it, it, you know, and Pete, Peter, you know, it's just amazing, you know. He, he preached his first sermon and quotes this and so on. And he, he quote, but before Pentecost, Peter denied Jesus three times. He totally failed. I mean, he was a proud guy as well. He said, I'll never do that. And then he did it. And he failed, and he had misery, and, you know, he could have easily just gone and killed himself because he just realized that he denied the, the, the Savior of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But yet then Pentecost comes, and everything changes. He gets up, preaches a message, his very first one. He quotes some scriptures, and 3,000 people get saved. Phew! Wow, Peter... Verse 1 and 2, the day of Pentecost arrived. They're all together in one place. And suddenly, love that word, there came from heaven a sound like mushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And it's just fantastic. And you know the story. Maybe tongues of fire came upon everybody. Everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit. They began speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them uh, evidence. And because of the sound... Many, many people gathered because they were gathered there for a festival. And it says every language of the world was gathered there. And the people, when they heard it, were astonished. And they heard their language being spoken. And what was being spoken was praise. It says it praise and thanksgiving and the great works of God. Wow. And they were hearing it in their own language of people that can't speak their language. That was a miracle in itself. Of course, then somebody, every, everybody's got their opinions. So this, the guy says, wow, this, what does this all mean? And the other says, ah, they're just drunk. Seeing a miracle and then just say, well, it's just drunk. Or, it's not from God. It's not that, you know, it, it, that kind of thing happens. Verse 14, Peter stands up. With 11, he lifts up his voice and addresses men in Judea and all dwell in Jerusalem. Let it be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, <laughs> as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. Of course, today, you, it's a lot of drunks can be that way as well. But, but this is it, verse 16. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. He says, what is happening here of the baptism of the Holy Spirit being empowered by God? What is happening here? The Holy Spirit fallen and miracles taking place is what Joel prophesied and it was the beginning of the end. He said in verse 17, the last days it shall be God declares that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Wow. And it's still going on today. 
Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, then they will prophesy. And then he changes. And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And this next verse has been in the news. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Many, many Christians are looking at this because we had an eclipse. And that looks like a sign. Could be or can't be. That's not what I'm talking about. However, these things are going to happen. And it's before the, the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day that the Lord comes. And he's saying, not only is the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon us to be able to take the message and reconcile as many people as we can, the end times is going to be about blood and shed blood and fire and, and, and uh, uh, wars and rumors of wars and signs in the heavens and signs on, on the earth. And man's heart is going to become so bad, so evil, so full of sin, so full of pride and revenge and hatred. And that's the signs, and the and and it's it's just amazing till it comes to the day that Jesus Christ comes, which is the final judgment day when He comes. And so we got two aspects of Pentecost: a great outpouring, but then we've got the troubled times and the stressful times. That's what it says throughout the scriptures. But verse 21 in Peter's sermon, he says, it shall come to pass that everyone calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, will be rescued from. Thank you, Lord. We got the joy of the Lord, the outpouring, and now we got the signs and the end times. And God does love us. And he's got a plan. And it's a plan for people to get rescued and saved to the eternal God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, this is where now, after the kind of the bad news, he brings the good news and he quotes Psalm 16. In verse, he uh in Acts 2.25, he says, I saw the Lord always before me, and so on like that. And he ends with verse 28, you have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. What really struck me in, I mean, it's just in your study, in, in Psalm 16, in, the, in most translations, it says you will do this. Okay, that's in the future. You will do this. Peter is saying here now, you have done it. Hallelujah. Jesus has died, buried, and risen from the dead. And it says in Acts chapter 2, after he goes and talks about his dying and all about sin and everything, he came in verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter, rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? That thing cut to the heart is, is more than, well, it certainly isn't literally. It's an uh, idiom, and it means you have remorse for your sins. You have tears for your sins. You have conviction of the Holy Spirit. You have sorrow of what you have done against the Lord of all lords. And Peter said, the main response to hearing this news is repent and be baptized. Verse 38. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what's even greater, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, that's us. Everyone whom the Lord calls himself. And with many words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself. How do you do that? By repenting and believing. So those who received his word were baptized, and there was added that day about 3,000 souls. Whew. 
Thank you, Lord. <laughs> That's just amazing. So he still wants us, and they entered in, you know, a miracle of repenting and believing, entered in, they were born again, they were saved, they got baptized. Wow, and now they're ready to enjoy the very presence of God. Fullness of joy, no matter what happens. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to bring just something now. So we got the beginning of the end. We got the joy of the Lord in his presence. We got the beginning of the end, which is very, very important because the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our lives was for us to have the joy, but also have the entrusting to us to reconciling other people because the end is coming and people need to hear the message. Amen? And so we need to have both. And then we know in the end times, there's going to be incredible problems and signs and all this. Sometimes that actually opens people's lives to hear the message. Many of them hear the message now going through problems and troubles. And so the Lord spoke to me I believe, and said there's a spirit of heaviness that's come upon the church worldwide, but specifically I've seen it on our church and our leaders and everyone, this spirit of heaviness. And it's... I looked it up. I'll read just the one scripture because I've got a lot of it, but it's in Isaiah 61, verse 3. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them the beauty of ashes, the joy, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting in the Lord, that they may be glorified. I was looking at this spirit of heaviness because it is a real spirit. And that spirit, the other translation, spirit of despair, spirit of discouragement, spirit of, of weakness of the soul, spirit of disheartened spirit, um, overwhelmed and stressed. And are you, anybody relating to any of this happening? To, <laughs> I just, I just can't believe it. And, it's attacking you. And it speak, the devil speaks and says, you're no good and you can't do this. And that is this and this. And you failed just like he would have spoken to Peter. You failed and da-da-da-da. And did Peter fail again? Probably. But yet he knew, hallelujah, that particular verse, the joy of his presence. And I've set my heart and I've set my mind unto the Lord no matter what. Hallelujah, because he's in charge and he's there. And then the, the curses and family curses. There's a lot of family curses that we just don't know about, particularly in health. We said, my mom had this, my dad had that, and now I'm getting it, and it just goes on. And we got to break those curses as well. The spirit of heaviness is all over the world, and it's an a, 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 a demon attack upon our lives. And why? Because we are out there wanting to take the gospel to the world. Hallelujah. He's not going to just sit back. He'll sit back if people don't know the gospel. But if you know it and want to do something, he's going to attack. But it's a wonderful thing here. He says, I give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Wow. Song of praise, heart of praise and thanksgiving is a weapon against it. It truly is because the devil cannot stand praise. And we need to do what Paul told the Thessalonian church was going through incredible persecution. And he says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God concerning us. And if we want to break this spirit of heaviness, 
We need to rejoice always. And we need to pray without ceasing. And, and we need to give thanks in the circumstance. And not for the circumstance, but in the circumstance, because you can always see something that's different than, your, than somebody worse off than you, for one thing. But I did go into places like Kenya and different very poor places. And I come home and I turn the tap on and there's actual water. And if I turn the other way, it's actually hot water. I said, Lord, thank you. <laughs> you know, I mean, just, just think of all that we have. And the world, half the world doesn't have any, it doesn't even experience any of that kind of stuff. But God has blessed us abundantly. And give thanks always, even through our circumstances. And they're tough. They really are tough. I want to finish with this Psalm, Psalm 131. And it's, again, David. He knows the psalm that he wrote, Psalm 16. He knows that. But here he says this. He says, verse 1, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Content, happy, knowing his mother's taking care of him. That's what he's like. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And the Lord just was speaking to me in my private time. And he told me, don't occupy yourself in your mind with things that are too great and that you are not in control. And we start thinking this and that, what happens? And you watch the news and 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 it's all it's all there and everything. It's oh they shouldn't do that. And, and you start thinking and occupying yourselves in your mind. And I actually wrote this in my journal. I said especially on Sunday, because Sunday is a day God has made for man, and that's to have all the things of the mind and all the work and what you're going to do and all your to do lists. And I even wrote down all the things that are going on at the. Oh my goodness! And we got we got a new pastor. We got this. We got that. And and, and uh, I mean it just goes on and on. And I, I list and then I said. Oh, crossed it off. I said, on Sunday, don't occupy your mind with that kind of stuff. But enjoy the fellowship because it stretches you out. And he says, but I, instead of that, I've come and quieted in my soul. And I wrote down, Lord, how do we do that? <laughs> because you can know the psalm, but not the reality of it in your life. And, and so this is the practical side, and I'll go through them very quickly. The first thing you do is, especially in depression and so on, is give thanks. It kind of changes everything. Giving thanks is the highest form of praise. That's why it tells us often to give thanks. Not just coming to church, not singing songs. This is at home, Lord... Wow, I don't feel, I don't even feel like getting out of bed. I'm depressed and I got to do this and that. And I said, no, give thanks. And Lord, thank you. Thank the Lord for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for being saved. Thank you. Quote Psalm 16. And then, but not just for yourself, just, you know, thank Him for your friends and your material things. And, and, you know, friendship is the greatest treasure you have. Others that, are serving Jesus just like you. Well, thank the Lord for them. The second thing to do then is pray for others. There's always somebody worse off that you know personally that they're going through something. Pray for them. Wow. And the Lord will give you, remind you of those things. And after that, you know, I'm starting to feel better. But then the third thing is be clean. 
Lord, is there anything? Show me if there's anything because I want to enjoy this presence of yours. And it's a privilege. I put down in my journal, it's a privilege to be able to confess your sin and then receive total forgiveness and cleansing. Wow. When you got those three things done, man, you are ready for the day. <laughs> Hallelujah. But there's more. It, it, the, the, the next the thing is, is, is take time with the Lord. And He will show you some of the stresses of life and everything. And He will show you. And that's what He did. He showed me this spirit of heaviness was getting all over me. And I was moping around the house and everything. And what do you do about that? You cast it out. Hallelujah. You, you speak in tongues. And cast this thing out too. And the Holy Spirit will speak in through you and it will go, it will leave. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So you have the authority to do that and on other people as well and cast it off. And then get on with your life because you have just calmed and quieted your soul like a winged child. So therefore now, what he says, verse 3, hope in the Lord. Hope and move in faith today is going to be the greatest day of your life. Thank you, Lord. He, Isaiah 26, He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because you trust in Him. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord is an everlasting rock. I love what Rosie shared today about peace and that same verse, peace, verse four, John 14, I leave with you. This is one of the greatest gifts outside of salvation that Jesus gives. Peace every day. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. The world doesn't have peace. Let not your heart be troubled. And don't be afraid. Because I am there with you. So, dear brothers and sisters, Psalm 16, verse 11. And I'd like you to look at that in the NLT. And this is what it says, and read it with me, if you will. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give God a clap. Amen. Wow, thank you, Lord. Pastor Steve. Praise God. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves me and he loves you too. Let's try that with a bit more enthusiasm. Just give them a, um, a high five or put your hand on their shoulder and let them know that there is joy in the presence of the Lord. Lord, we want to thank you that we cast off, we're not having, we're not receiving a spirit of heaviness. And we say no to that. We command that spirit to be gone. We put on the garment of praise and salvation. We do give thanks to you. We do pray for others. We do get right with you. And we do spend time with you. And Lord, right now today, heaviness stops. Heaviness stops because what was the word from the Lord? Enjoy the journey. So we thank you, Lord. We're on the journey. We're going to glory, but we're on the journey. And we want to enjoy it, and we will enjoy it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to carry on praying tonight. It's our prayer meeting this evening. God bless you. Look, the sun is shining. It's a lovely day out there. Uh, why don't you bless someone next to you? There's tea and coffee, and there will be prayer in the, the craft room on my right-hand side here. If anyone needs prayer, just go in there, and someone will pray for you. Um, so uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, and God bless you. And I think um, it's it's Mandy's birthday today, and they're going to have a cake in the room there. The children are going to wish her a happy birthday. And it's James's birthday today. So happy birthday, James. Good to see you. So bless you. So uh, anyway, turn to the person next to you. Give them a bit of a hug and encourage them and bless them.